from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, this is Business Rockstars. I'm Jeannie Ehrman, and our guest today is Oshin Hanrahan. He is the co-founder and CEO of Handy. Great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So Handy, you guys, it's a platform that is connecting people with home service professionals. And unfortunately, those of us who have homes know we need those people all the time. So tell us about it. Yeah, Handy solves a really common problem. We all know how hard it is to book home services. You think about all the things you need done inside your home from getting a cleaner to a handyman, a plumber, electrician, a carpenter. And it's really a challenge to both find the people, schedule, negotiate the price, figure out if they're going to do a good job. And Handy solves all that by making it incredibly easy to book home services. So today you can go to Handy.com or the Handy mobile app, go through a couple of questions, check out instantly, pay online and know that someone's going to show up and do a really great job. How long have you guys been around? We started Handy about eight years ago. Okay. And, and how, how did that happen? Look, I think some people talk about this magical moment in time in their journey when they're like, oh my goodness, I just realized this is exactly the business. For me, it was a little more gradual where I saw the problem a few different times. I saw when I was in Budapest, I was in Hungary, I ran a real estate development and construction business, and I realized how hard it was to bring contractors together. I realized that it was such a pain point to like organize and make sure that people were going to show up and do a great job when you were renovating an apartment. And then I moved to Boston. I did one year at business school. And I saw the same problem again of how hard it was for people living in cities to find a plumber or a cleaner or a handyman. And those two things were kind of happening you know, sequentially. And then there was this moment where I realized that mobile was going to change everything. And mobile commerce, and we saw Uber, we saw Lyft, we saw this change in how people were using mobile to interact with the world around them. And that was when we started Handy about eight years ago with this idea that people would just book services on mobile and use their phone to essentially manage everything inside their home and in some cases, everything inside their lives. Um, I was chuckling. I was reading an article um, about how when you very first started, uh, because you were just figuring all of this out, you were actually texting with the professionals, yeah. <laughs> which didn't really work and subsidizing the phones. So how was it in the early days and then how did it evolve? Look, I think businesses have these different phases or startups have these different phases. The first phase is who, who, who cares enough? And for us, it was a two-sided marketplace. So we had customers and we had pros and the customers, we really wanted to know, did they really want to book services? So we put up a very easy and simple website that would just take bookings. And for our pros, we didn't even, we didn't even want to you know, go through the process of asking them to download an app that we didn't even have. And instead we said, let's just text them and let's put up an ad saying cleaners wanted and handymen wanted. And that was like the first version of Handy. You made a booking online and we just manually would text pros and it really showed very fast engagement that so many customers were willing to make a booking online. And it proved out that thesis that people really wanted to book services online. And on the other side, people really wanted work. So pros, local handyman, local cleaners, local plumbers, they really wanted to text to get work and have work delivered to them in an incredibly seamless and easy way. And obviously through time, you can't send thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and millions of text messages to organize bookings. So we gradually moved over to having our pros use a mobile app, which obviously is much more common today. Okay. Uh, off camera and ahead of this interview, we were talking about, um, you know, kind of the complexity um, and how I was saying, I was thinking of a business that would involve a lot of programmers. Um, what was it like to move from what you've just described with in the early days to a platform? How did that happen and what did it take? Yeah, so I think once you go past this first phase of making sure that people care about your market and people care about the problem you're solving, it then becomes about growth. And typically these things, you know, if they start to work, attract venture capital. And then when, once there's venture capital in one, uh, in one person in your category, in one company in your category, it typically generates a lot of competition. So there's, I don't know, three, four, five, six, sometimes even more companies all similarly funded, and it becomes about growth. So how do you grow to be large enough to matter? And some categories are winner takes all or winners take most. And for us, it was very obvious. We were in a marketplace where 
it was really important to be the largest player in the category. And it was important because it delivered a better experience. Customers wanted to be on the platform that had the most pros. Pros wanted to be on the platform with the most customers. And it became about using technology to grow. So building the best customer experience online that would allow customers to book as seamlessly as possible so they could take care of their home, so they would come back again and again and again. And similarly on the pro side, building a really seamless, easy experience for pros to use the platform, to find work, to get paid, you know, in some cases, same day, so that they would just work really well together. And obviously technology is a really important part of figuring out how to get these platforms to scale. Um, you had started, you'd mentioned uh, you had a business early on um, in real estate development. Um, then you had a business called My Candidate, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Which was about aggregating kind of information about political candidates in one place, mm -hmm. and now Handy. Uh, all of them uh, required scaling, yep. right? What is the common thread between, you know, amongst all these businesses uh, that you can kind of pull out and talk about scaling? What did you learn? So I think there's a few things. The first is of all the things I've worked on, I look back on them, they were all about figuring out how to create value for multiple people. So it wasn't simply about an economic impact. It was about how, when I was doing real estate in Budapest, it was a very sustainable uh, model where we would increase development on underutilized buildings and make sure that it was good for the city, it was good for the residents, it was good for investors, and it was overall like a very positive thing. Similarly, when, when I was working on my candidate, it was a multi-party thing where it was creating value for multiple people. You think about what's happening with Handy today, there's customers, there's pros, and obviously there's the team at Handy itself, but it really does make life better for multiple groups of people. And I think that's the common thread. In terms of scale, I think they're all very different scaling stories. And I think that was one of the reasons why I spent a little time in venture was to learn like what makes these things scale? What are the common themes around scaling? And obviously it comes back to with things we all understand and know today, like addressing a really big market, having perhaps network effects in the business so that as the business gets bigger, it gets better. And also I point to this desire to have a platform that truly has natural growth built into it. And some of that comes back to network effects and some of it comes back to a general wave of change. So if you're moving to mobile, if the world is moving to mobile, if people are moving to you know, transacting for services online, I think those are some of the themes that you see around waves of change. Uh, when you mention natural growth, what do you mean by that exactly? So at any point in time, you think about some of the changes that are going on in the world. And you're either fighting against those changes or you're being supported by them. And obviously a shift to mobile would be an example of a change that's occurring through much broader segments of society mm -hmm. than uh, say a shift back to desktop or a shift to offline payment. Okay. Um, now, originally there were four partners, right? And two of them are gone. How did that evolve? Like, why was that? And, and how did they decide to go? And, and then how did you divvy up what was left, the responsibilities that were left? So I think whenever you start a business, you've got this idea of the journey that you're going to go on. And you have some uh, notion about what the relative growth is going to be needed from each person as you go on that journey. And I think most people underestimate how much they're going to have to change over the course of a startup journey. And Perhaps you think it's going to be three, four or five years. In fact, it's more like a seven to 10 year journey. And obviously, enormous amount changes as you raise capital over the course of the you know, first five years at Handy. We raised over $100 million of capital to grow the business. The expectations change. The teams change. The roles and responsibilities of the founders change. And for some people, it made sense to stay. So my co-founder, Omong, and I stayed along and obviously continue to run the business today. Other, the, the other two folks uh, decided to leave at a much earlier stage. And it was you know, a perfectly fine outcome. Uh, you mentioned venture capital several times. Um, what what do people need to know about raising venture capital? Look, not every business is a venture capital backed business, and I think we make this mistake today of talking about every business in the context of how to make sure that it can raise capital. And mm -hmm. I think the reality is most businesses are not applicable for venture. The expectations of venture returns are 10, 15, 20, 50, 100x for some of the earliest investors. And that requires enormous scale and it requires an enormous change in, in some cases, the economics of the core business. I think the biggest piece of advice on venture is to really pressure test and really stress test whether your business model, whether you as an individual 
and whether the industry and category you're in are truly suitable for venture capital. People can have excellent financial returns for themselves, build excellent businesses without raising venture capital. I think for some people, it makes a ton of sense. If you're in a category where it's highly competitive, where there's enormous network effects, where there's going to be massive scaling, and when you can address a really large market, perhaps it makes sense to raise venture capital, but really pressure test whether you're raising venture capital just to get a story out that you've raised venture capital or whether you're doing it for the right reasons. And I think that, you know, requires a really large amount of personal discipline. Right. And I've also heard, you know, be, be leery of people who are throwing money at you. Don't take it just because any you know, people are offering it. You have to be very judicious look, about look, raising I think money. When, when it comes to raising capital, I think you want your business to fit very close to the bullseye of the fund that you're raising. And by that, I mean, you don't want to be an outlier. If a fund invests in series A consumer companies and you've got a, you know, a seed round SaaS business, probably don't take money from that fund because you'll be benchmarked against funds that are against companies that are not necessarily similar to yours. And the partners involved won't have as much relevant experience with your particular type of company. So try and be as close as possible to the middle of the average of what, uh, of what the fund is investing in, because it just makes it so much easier for the fund to be helpful to you, for the comps that they're going to benchmark you against to be relevant. I think that's like an, another overlooked thing. Okay. Uh, your, this is your last question. Um, you've been at this now for eight years, um, a very successful company. Uh, that has grown quite a bit. Uh, what never gets old for you um, in leading this company? For us, for me, it's all about the people. So how do we go out and recruit the best talent? How do we build a team? Oh, obviously, over the course of eight years, you see change in management, you see folks leaving. It gives you an opportunity to go out and build a new team every single time. It gives you an opportunity to give people who have not yet had you know, a certain learning experience, a new learning experience. It gives you an opportunity to put people together who have not yet worked together, and that never gets old. It never gets old to bring a new set of people together, whether it's to address the same challenge or address a new challenge, bring groups of people together, giving them a goal, setting a, a tone, and really figuring out how to motivate people to take on a really big challenge never gets old. That's great. Well, congratulations on all the success you've had, and I wish you much more. Thanks so much. Uh, Oshin, if people want to find more information on the company, where would they go to find info on you and the company? They can go to handy.com. Oh, pretty easy. Um, thanks so much for the time. Thank you. We've been speaking with Oshin Hanrahan. He is the co-founder and CEO of Handy. From the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, this is Business Rockstars.